like to welcome each one of you back here to the Council of Adventist Pastors today. I'm Mike Lambert, pastor of the Stateline Seventh-day Adventist Church here in the Upper Columbia Conference. And once again, we have Larry Kirkpatrick with us today from the Bonners Ferry District. And Larry, we want to thank you so much for being back with us. Thank you. It's good to be down here for uh, to be in this place from Idaho. Yeah, and Larry, um, we want to move into our next segment here. And uh, when the NAD came out with this 248-page report uh, back in November 2013, as part of their kind of new system of interpretation, they asked the church to adopt a trajectory or a redemptive movement type hermeneutic. And as we've taken a look at that, we have some problems with that, don't we? That's right. Uh, you know, the Council of Adventist Pastors, we began to study these things when they came out, and we were looking at uh, their big report in favor of women's ordination. And we began to look at some of the footnotes. The footnotes can be very uh, boring, but sometimes they can be very illuminating. So uh, among the uh, parts here where they are talking about why we would use these hermeneutical, new, herme new, new hermeneutical program they have, uh, they mention that we should, uh, the Adventist Church should adopt this redemptive movement trajectory hermeneutic. So uh, it turns out that one of the books they refer to in their uh, footnotes is this guy. This is William J. Webb, uh, and his book here is, you know, slaves, women, and homosexuals, and yeah. he is trying to apply principles, and it's interesting because he deals in here, he talks about vegetarianism, he talks about foot washing, he talks about the, the Sabbath, he talks about a few things that are Seventh-day Adventist type things, and uh, he applies this trajectory hermeneutic uh, himself, so we don't have to just kind of guess how this, how this turns out, but we can see how the people that developed it, how, what happens when they apply it to the Bible. And by the way, it's interesting, too, uh, Mike, that, that uh, William Webb is really building on what Christer Stendhal did. This fellow, the Lutheran scholar from a few decades, some decades before this, wrote this little book, uh, The Bible and the Role of Women. And uh, this is one of the beginning points for really, the, this is really the be beginning point for trajectory hermeneutic idea. And uh, Webb has built upon that uh, even further. And it's, you know, you mentioned uh, uh, in, in uh, the book Slaves, Women, and Homosexuals by Webb that he discusses some, some points of biblical truth that we agree with. Sure. Um, so it sounds like the NAD has, and does he even discuss the Sabbath? Oh, yes, discusses the Sabbath. So it sounds like uh, the NAD has found someone uh, to kind of quote from the footnote uh, who agree with us on a lot of things. Well, not exactly. Okay. So, well, then let's uh, uh, cut to the chase. And uh, what about the Sabbath? Well, let's just hear instead of what I think, but let's see what, what Webb says in his book. He's talking about uh, creation and the Bible and um, so on. So here on page 145, I think this is kind of an interesting item. By the way, this one isn't in the NAD footnotes, but it's in the book is at the footnotes. Okay. So uh, here's what uh, he says. He's summing up what he says. The patriarchy within the original creation narrative can be accounted for as a... So the original creation narrative, that's Genesis 1 and 2, yeah. just so we know what we're talking about. It can be accounted for as a literary anticipation of the curse, as a backwards projection of patriarchy into protology, or as a practical and gracious anticipation of the agrarian setting into which Adam and Eve were headed. The garden's patriarchy can be explained through any one of these possibilities, possibilities or a combination of them. In other words, he's saying that even though Genesis 1 and 2 talk very plainly about how God created the world and how he created Adam and Eve and all mm -hmm. those things, he's saying, well, uh, some of this patriarchy, it was just anticipated there. It's kind of written by the author. It's a writer's device uh, that goes back and he's kind of injected it into Genesis, but it wasn't really there that, that Moses or perhaps some other writer injected it back there. So it sounds like uh, some of Webb's views on this, as he used the, uses his principles, uh, it is really on the complicated side and certainly not compatible with the historical grammatical method of biblical interpretation. Yeah. And it sounds like he doesn't even accept the historical count in Genesis. Well, no. And... Um, the Sabbath observance subject, he talks about that in pages 125 to 127, for example. 
And uh, it's interesting here, when he's talking about the Sabbath, uh, some of his conclusions might be interesting to some of our, our uh, people watching this program. Uh, he says that, uh, well, let's see, on page 126, uh, he talks about churches. He says, for example, most have changed the Sabbath day from Saturday to Sunday, and many have softened the work prohibitions and penalties. Further, many Christians, while accepting various underlying Sabbath principles, do not prescribe any specific day of the week for its fulfillment. And he says, although I will not attempt to prove the case here, Sabbath offers a good example of a creation pattern with a significant cultural component. Well, that's kind of interesting. Uh, though the approaches differ, there is a general Christian consensus, general Christian consensus that this aspect of creation pattern should be modified to some extent. And he says the same thing down the page, uh, and on the next page here, the Edenic pattern, uh, and he talks about Sabbath regulations. Basically, the Sabbath can be modified. And he says, in fact, churches have kept the principle, but they have just, you know, they're not keeping the seventh day as the Sabbath. They're just doing it on Sunday because they're keeping... Because the, they're the, keeping the principle, the principle of it. The principle of it. Um, well... And so this way, uh, this approach of biblical interpretation, that certainly is not safe. Uh, and it's not, with, it's not consistent with how the Bible, uh, uh, te what the Bible teaches about itself. Uh, so Larry, if we, if we adopt the hermeneutical system that is similar to this and proposed by the NAD, this kind of trajectory approach, uh, we ultimately open the door to just about anything and could even possibly discard the Seventh-day Sabbath altogether. Well, when the people who developed this idea apply their own principle of interpretation, they throw away the Sabbath. Yeah, yeah. Something to think about before we adopt uh, willy-nilly these, these important principles. So, yeah, read the footnotes in the NAD report. It is sometimes uh, not as boring as it looked like. Yeah, yeah. Well, the Adventist approach to the Bible, Larry, is the same that's found in First Thessalonians 2 and verse 13. And uh, I'd like to read it here. First uh, Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse number 13 says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because... When you received the word of God, which you have heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in the truth, the word of God, which effectively worketh also in you that believe. That's and I a, want to hold to that. That's a Bible hermeneutic. There you go. And uh, we'd like to thank each one of you for joining us in this segment of our Council of Adventist Pastors. And it's our heart's desire that the simplicity of God's Word would effectively work in your heart and in your minds. And from the Council of Adventist Pastors, we wish God's richest blessing upon each one of you. And thank you for joining us.